Gather around, gather around, gather around. It's Monday night in East Lansing. Come on in, grab a beverage. Hopefully the microphone's working. Let me know if it is. Uh, it's time to talk Michigan State sports from East Lansing, Michigan. You are watching Spartan Mag Live on a Monday night, switching it from Fridays to Mondays a little bit. Not sure how much longer that's going to be the case, but worked pretty good last week. Going to be doing it again this week. Might make this one shorter and uh, fit another one in maybe later this week. Have football, have baseball practice Tuesday and Thursday. There's hockey practice going on now, Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday we've got an alumni thing going on also. Uh, it's going to be for alumni club members, so we can't do it on Wednesday night. Anyway, come on in. We're going to talk Michigan State sports. We've got about 10 or 11 questions from the Underground Bunker message board over at SpartanMag.com. We use those questions mailbag style here. Also, feel free to post some questions over in the chat area. We will get to those. And make sure you give us a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you go to SpartanMag.com. If you're not already a member, become one. And also on Twitter, the Spartan Mag. Check out the Spartan Mag on Twitter. Jim Caproni on Twitter also. But the Spartan Mag is one that Justin Thind is doing a lot of good work with. Justin doing a great job with us. Newcomer to SpartanMag.com. Paul Conerdyke, Corey Robinson, always doing a great job. Great coverage this week. I've been getting back into it since taking a little bit of time off two weeks ago. And uh, starting to uh, try to point toward possibly some Michigan State football camp in the coming weeks. Not sure. Sounds, uh, I mean, around here, sports are moving forward. I dare to say even uh, traditionally and with some normalcy. Uh, around the other, other parts of the country, there are some, it's... Uh, it's a lot tougher. That's the way it was around here back in April and March. So uh, the thing is, a, it's, a, it's a moving target. I don't know, but around here, they're practicing football. And this Friday, across the country, NCAA teams are supposed to begin uh, their enhanced workouts. That's when they're able to use footballs in practice, I think like one hour a day. Um it's going to be like a like a spring practice that they missed out on, except no pads, no helmets. But that begins this Friday. I misspoke last week and indicated that was already the case. That's not the case. They're just doing workouts right now, and uh, all things are, are going pretty well from um, what I've been hearing. Hayden Fisher asks if there's been any media availability or whether it'll start on Friday. You know, I sent out a text today to Michigan State people specifically Ben Flieger at Michigan State, who does a great job representing the university as the liaison from between the university and the media corps, and just asked him any chance that we in the media might get a chance to speak with Mel Tucker by the end of the week, maybe prior to Friday, in advance of kicking off those enhanced um, workouts and practices. Haven't heard back from him yet, but it seems like it would be a good time to do something like that. You know that Mel Tucker would love to be doing any kind of media right now. He's he's really forward thinking in that regard. There might be some hesitation because uh, coaches will be asked what their thoughts are about the chances of having a football season in general and and things of that nature. And maybe they don't want coaches talking about those things right now. I saw that uh, Diaz down in Miami spoke with media last week and then a few hours later, they shut everything down. But you're not seeing a lot of coaches doing a lot of media right now. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. I've not gone out and looked for a lot, but I've not seen a lot of indica indications on my Twitter feed and so forth. But it would be great to get a chance to talk to Michigan State coaches, just Mel Tucker, to ask him what his impressions are after a couple of weeks of optional workouts. And then lately, they've had the non-optional workouts. I'm sure he has some opinions. And it'd be great to talk some college football, and we will be there ready to do it whenever Tucker and Michigan State uh, start releasing some of that information, and hopefully things continue to step forward with some normalcy. I know a couple of weeks ago when the Big Ten announced that they were shutting down um, the non-conference games and only having Big Ten conference games, a lot of people thought that that was a precursor toward... Uh, you know, shutting down the season in general. Well, we've gone about two weeks. That did not happen. I guess a week and a half, that didn't happen. Still fingers crossed, still some anxiety there, but maybe the anxiety has subsided a little bit. But 
Old Tuck coming in. Great to hear from Old Tuck. Great to get uh, a sponsorship from the big toe of the program. And he throws a question out there, so I've got to get to that one right now. Let's see if I can find that thing. I've got to get over here and refresh my page, my darn self. There it is. Hopefully we don't get any audio feedback. Tell you what, uh, old Tuck, I'll get here it is. I got it right now. Izzo recruiting higher level. Why? Hall of Fame status taking hold. Cheating programs becoming more cautious. New approach from staff. Your thoughts? Um, recruiting at a higher level. Level where they got they got Pierre Brooks. That's par for the course. That's an Izzo type of player. Max Christie, first time Michigan State's gone into Chicago land and beaten Mike Shashevsky for a player. Duke wanted Max Christie. What happened there? Doug Wojcik had a lot to do with that. Doug Wojcik's son plays for the same AAU team as Max Christie. So Wojcik had been in on the Christie recruitment for a while, knew a lot about it, knew their family, knew their family was the type of family that would be receptive to the Izzo way of things. Very down-to-earth family, very recruitable family. No funny business. Also, so they knew Wojcik. Wojcik knew them. Wojcik clued Izzo into it a long time ago, saying this is the type of guy you can go get. So Wojcik had a lot to do with that. Of course, the Izzo pro, the Michigan State program, the Izzo profile had everything to do with finishing that deal. But that recruitment was a little bit different in that Wojcik had it in with them. So you're saying recruiting at a higher level. One is Brooks. One is Christie. I gave you a couple of reasons for those two. Those are the two commitments right now. They need to close on Jaden Akins. And now the big news today, Enoch Boachi, the big six foot eleven kid from Brampton, Ontario, Canada, announced that he will be making a decision. I think it's July 29th. Coming up in about nine days. Six foot ten, two forty. Supposedly has a seven foot six wingspan wingspan. Uh, offers from UCLA, Arizona, Oklahoma State, Michigan State, Texas Tech, and a few others. He's announcing, he'll be announcing his plans in nine days. And um, I know Justin Thind, who does a great job with us, has really had his ear to the ground on that recruitment. Corey Robinson had an article about Enoch last week. Michigan State offered. Corey doing a great job while I was on vacation, coming through strong with that story about that offer. And here a few days later, he announces he's going to be making a decision. Justin Thind, uh, he also used to be known as JT on our message board at, at the, under, the final forum message board, a message board that's all about Michigan State basketball over at SpartanMag.com. JT's been all over this thing, and he has his ear to the ground really well, and um, he is giving strong indications that uh, he believes Boachi is going to be committing to Michigan State. So I can stay here and tell you, I can sit right here and tell you that I'm predicting he's going to Michigan State, but um, that wouldn't that would be uh, that would not be doing proper service to JT because Justin Thind has his ear to the ground, doing a good job as a recruiting sleuth, and he's got that information and I trust it, and I'm expecting Boachi to commit to Michigan State because uh, Thind, there's Justin cutting it, cutting in right now. I want to give all credit to Justin; he's got the information on that. And there, as a news organization at SpartanMag.com, we will uh, we respect that. And, and he's a reporter, and uh, he's got this one. And Boachi, expecting him to become a Spartan, seven foot six, wingspan, some athleticism. I was looking at his, his film a little bit ago. Has some thickness to him for a young guy at six ten. Sometimes those young guys that are six ten. They uh, can be a little bit of a string bean, a little bit awkward, a little bit ungainly. I think that he has a chance to improve his body control, but his body control is already pretty good. He's got some thickness. He's got some agility. And you see the agility with Boachi with some ball fake moves. You see him back down counter move with the beginnings of a nice little hook shot. Finishes with power. Runs the court with a little bit of a glide. Um, further along in his basketball than I think Sissoko was. So, so Sissoko... Maddie Sissoko, big guy with a lot of hot horsepower, high ceiling in his own right. This guy's stronger than Bingham was. Bingham had a good outside shot, but you see not quite good enough to be a shot you want to attempt a lot at the college level through his first two years of college. So I think uh, Boachi brings a lot to the table. 
and a lot of indications he will be reclassifying to the 2021 class. And we will talk about that a little bit more as we go further into tonight's Spartan Mag Live. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're with us on a Monday night. Hopefully these will become a Monday night thing in which we can talk about Saturday's football game as we get into September. Monday would be a good day to come in and have our little fireside chat to talk about all things Michigan State sports. As far as uh, the Spartan Mag Live mailback, let's go to question number one, MSU Polo from Rockford, Michigan. He says, how do you explain Michael Mislinski's two-star recruiting ranking on Rivals.com? So Michael Mislinski is another guy we'll be talking about. He's a center from Jacksonville, Florida, about six foot two and a half, maybe six three. You know, um, he visited Michigan State a few days ago. And um, you can't have true visits at this time of year because of NCAA rules and the way things are shut down. But some recruits are taking visits to see campuses before making their decisions because they want to see campuses before they make decisions. Ms. Link, Ms. Linsky's looking at Iowa and Michigan State, two schools that are outside of his geographic region, so he went on a trip. He visited some other schools also. Corey Robinson with a great story at SpartanMag.com detailing Ms. Linsky's trip to Michigan State and his thoughts about Michigan State. I thought it was really, um, really insightful. So... The question about Ms. Linsky is, you know, he's got offers from what, Florida State, Oregon. You know, when Oregon is offering offensive linemen from across the country, that, that speaks pretty strongly. Iowa with an offer, Missouri and some others. But he's a two-star recruit for Rivals.com. Others have him ranked higher. And I, for one, disagree with, with Rivals.com on this. I think, he's, I think he's a three-star guy, maybe a high three-star guy. Why is he two-star? Maybe because he's six foot two. And most of his film is as a guard, but I see him as a center, and I think Michigan State does too. The last time Michigan State signed a two-star Rivals.com offensive lineman, I think it was, I think it was Matt Allen, right? And he's going to be a three-year starter this year, so that's not bad. Uh, I, I thought Matt Allen should have been a three-star back then, but anyway, MSU Polo says. Um, how do you explain his ranking? He has a four-star offer list. I don't know if I'd say a four-star offer list, but it's a good offer list. And his film looks outstanding. I think his film looks pretty good. Outstanding. Um, if he were six foot four doing the things he were doing, he's doing, then I would agree outstanding. I think his film looks good. Saying, wondering if he's a late bloomer or is there something else going on there? You know, with Mislinski, reminds me a little bit when I look at him at six foot two. Reminds me of Travis Jackson when he was at Columbus DeSales, or even when maybe better than Jackson was as a junior. Maybe looks like Jackson did as a freshman at Michigan State. Travis Jackson was quick and athletic. Ms. Linsky, quick, athletic. Really runs to get to uh, whether he's finishing a block, a blindside block. You saw that on one of his on, on his film if you've looked at his film, but you know. Gets out to the linebacker level, low, comfortably as he should at six foot two. You should have good body control if you're going to be a shorter offensive lineman. But you see legit speed and agility, and that tells me I think he's got the ability as a center to be a snap and pull center, which is a nice, uncommon trait to have in an offense. Michigan State with Jay Johnson, they want to use a lot of inside zone, outside zone, and having a center that could. Snap and pull can really help on outside zone and counter boot action, which they like. So six foot two is not ideal, but he is um he's an athlete and well schooled, well coached. You see him when, when he plays with his zone steps getting out into his man. Really well coached, getting his feet down, heel on the ground. <clears throat> That's another thing that reminds me of Travis Jackson coming from a private school team just like Ms. Linsky for Bishop Kenny at Jacksonville coming from a private school. So a lot of comparisons there. Travis Jackson, a very good player. The yes, yes, yes guy, part of the Rose Bowl team. I think Ms. Linsky is similar to that. And Corey Robinson's story on him, if you haven't seen it, go back and read it. You know, Ms. Linsky on campus with his family, 
His dad's a coach, strength coach, I think, with the Jaguars. And they speak highly of Jason Novak, Michigan State's new strength coach. I'm hearing a lot of good things about Jason Novak from players, from parents of players. Jason Novak knows his stuff, energetic, excited to drive the big rig here at Michigan State. Ken Manning was great. Ken Manning was a Hall of Famer of Michigan State. And he was nothing but professional and respectful to Spartan Mag and SpartanMag.com and Spartan Magazine over the years. Ken Manning has a lot to do with a lot of trophies that are in that building. And someday I think that weight room could and should be named after him. But as we get older, we, we all lose a little bit of a step. And I'll do that someday if I haven't already. As a matter of fact, I feel I've lost a step in some ways. Hopefully I can make up for that with a little bit of wisdom, but who knows. But Ken Manny, as great as he was in the last couple of years, was not 100% full tilt like, he, like I don't want to say like he used to be or like what's needed. I'm hearing that from players and so forth. So, in all due respect to Ken Manny, um, I'm not surprised that Novak has come in and hit full throttle and really impressed the new players or his new players. Ken Manny, nothing but respect. I'm just giving an observation based on things that, not that I've observed because I didn't see it with myself, but things I've been hearing from good sources. That uh, And Ken may have even felt that himself. I don't know, but, you know, you're allotted so many hours, and you got to take those hours to the, to the max each week. But Ken can email me if he's upset with that. But I've got great respect for him. But Novak taking it up a notch. Novak knows them as Linsky's in the conditioning, strength and conditioning community. And one of Novak's assistants used to work with Miss Linsky's dad. This is all in Robinson's story. Robinson did a great job at SpartanMag.com researching this story on Miss Linsky and what the initial draw was for Ms. Lin- Ms. Linsky to Michigan State. So he comes up here and visits. Thought the campus was great. Campus is beautiful in June. It's even more beautiful when you have people walking around and things being utilized. But campus is a little bit dead right now for obvious reasons. I've been driving through campus a little bit the last couple of weeks. Not a lot going on, as you would imagine. But it's still nice in June, especially if you're coming up from Florida. Get a little bit of a break heat-wise. But like Corey had in his story, they faced the coaches FaceTimed with... Ms. Linsky, Mike Mislinsky, as he walked through campus and it changed from coach to coach as he went from different building to different building. And these coaches were well versed on the campus and certain things around campus. And he thought that that was pretty cool. Had a similar type of tour with Iowa while on campus, went over to the dairy store, got some ice cream. I think they ate at Beggar's Banquet, which is still in existence. I think it's been gutted and changed around a little bit in there. Uh, what else did he do? Oh, he was excited with the Eli Broad, Eli Broad Art Museum. He was fascinated that part of one of the Batman movies was filmed there. So I think that was kind of uh, a plus for Michigan State that nobody really anticipated. Uh, Corey Robinson has had his ear to the ground well on this recruitment for a long time, and he thinks it's Michigan State and Iowa. So I will defer to Corey Robinson on that one. Iowa has not been getting the greatest press lately as you may well be aware of. So I think that helps Michigan State. I think Michigan State's got a shot here for an offensive lineman in Florida who's ranked pretty well in other sites. Two-star for Rivals.com. If he goes to Michigan State, if you're a Michigan State fan, a stargazer, and you're interested in those rankings, you will hope that that, gets, that, that would get uh, reclassified to a three-star at some point. Hard to do that in this day and age with no camps in the summer um, if they have football in the fall in Florida, maybe some of that film will be reevaluated. But um, I suspect the height thing might have something to do with it. But there's, it's hard to be a really quality offensive lineman at six foot two. But there are some of them out there. There are plenty of them that are out there. But he's a, he's at least a three. He's a three star in my book. So I know you'd like to see the rankings get um, get a bump from what I would consider to be an excellent commitment. And Michigan State sees Mislinski as a plan A guy. So if Michigan State sees him that way, and if they get him, I would think if you're a Michigan State fan, you should be happy with that that uh, commitment. Michigan State wants him pretty badly. Now, let's go to – I think Polo had another question. 
Okay. He says, can you comment on the pursuit of Enoch Boachi in terms of his scouting report, possible commitment timeline? I already mentioned this was posted before Boachi announced he was going to be committing on July 29th and the likelihood of reclassification into the 2021 class. Okay, that's the that's the key right there. Again, Justin thinned with the uh, information there that Boachi very likely may recla- will will reclassify to 2021. You know, Michigan State bowed out of the Bediaco recruiting chase a couple of weeks ago. I thought that maybe that was after the uh, the Bates commitment and maybe not enough room, but actually it's probably a precursor to, toward moving more seriously with Boachi. And man, Boachi got some thickness, got some body control for a young teenager. Power above the rim moves well, and the one and the kicker is that uh, JT Justin Thin tells me that. Boachi and Imani Bates are good friends. They're pretty close, like really good friends. I'm still looking into when they became friends. Some of you may know, maybe they played on a team together. I'm not, uh, that, that's kind of news to me. But he really likes Bates, wants to play with Bates. And if Bates reclassifies and comes in in 2021, our guy on the scene, Justin Finn, says that if Bates does it, Boachi will do it. So right now I think they're both gonna I think they're both gonna reclassify. Does Bates end up at Michigan State? The way that the NBA changed their G League rules um, to accommodate who is that player that he he's not going to turn eighteen. They they waived the rule for. Uh, Justin Thin says he put it at about 60%. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that. But the, the player just, just last week that, that signed with, or is going to sign with the G League, they waived the 18-year age, age requirement, gave him a four-month lean on that or whatever. Would they do the same for Bates? I assume they would. Would they be concerned about the optics of now the, the G League Taking players, thank you, Jonathan Kaminga. Would they be concerned, the NBA be concerned about the optics of enticing players to leave high school early to give them, you know, half a million dollars to join the G League? Optics, would they be concerned about that? I think they may maybe should be concerned about that. Will they? I'm not sure. Would they want to get Bates into that G League to help really give the G League a brand push? Maybe. When that happened with Kaminga, I thought, I thought that Michigan State's chances with Bates and Bates going to playing a year in college decreased a little bit, down toward fifty percent. I thought sixty seventy percent that he'd play for Michigan State after he committed, um, because I, I thought he'd I thought he would reclassify, be seventeen years old, too young for the G League. He could get paid in Australia or somewhere else overseas, but I don't think he and his dad are interested in that right now. I heard Mick McCabe on a radio show last week make a very good point. He said, hey, Bates once upon a time said that he was going to be going to Ypsilanti Lincoln for four years, was not interested in playing prep school basketball, played two years at Lincoln, won a state championship as a ninth grader, had some rough moments as a 10th grader with some sportsmanship problems from opposing teams, which his dad didn't appreciate very much, and I don't blame him for that. So they soured a little bit on basic you know, high school varsity basketball. And quite frankly, he needed a better challenge. So they're looking to play a national prep schedule. So they created the new Ipsy Academy, whatever it's called, and started a high school and he'll be playing a national schedule there. So he didn't plan on doing that. I wouldn't go as far as to say he went back on his word. Uh, And Mick McCabe didn't quite paint it that way either. But Mick McCabe's point was that people can say things now but as they travel down the road, they might make different choices as they get there. He's made a different choice to start to go play for an academy team, create an academy team. Might he make a different choice after a couple of years of that and decide that he does not want to play college basketball and instead will have some instant riches offered to him if he goes G League or overseas. But I tell you what, if name, image, and likeness gets approved, he will have plenty of access to riches as a freshman at Michigan State, and he may become the Spencer Haywood of that rule. He may become the first guy to really cash in on that, and he could cash in 
I mean, eight figures. He could go tens of millions if they, because Nike will have that for him if if allowed as a freshman. Could change. Could be a game changer. So if that happens, um, if name, image, and likeness passes, he could make that money in college, and he wants the college experience. His dad wants him to have the college experience. His dad wants him to play for. Um, a hard-nosed coach that will demand defense. I mean, we can all see Bates has all kinds of ability with the ball in his hands, to the rim, with the shot, off the dribble, ball handling at his height, um, defense, strength, weight training, team concepts, IQ. I think his dad wants him to get some of those things at a college level from a guy like Izzo. And I think that's a good idea. I think that could help Bates become a better pro down the road. I think that'd be a good investment for um, the Bates the Bates uh, what would it be? It's not he's not just a player. He's a franchise for the for the Bates enterprise, the whole enterprise. So that's what I think about that. Question number two, Gator from Novi says, yes, sir, do you think Mike Tressel and Harlan Barnett can get the Michigan State defensive backfield playing like it did in the 2018 season? Do you have any insight into Barnett and Tressel's relationship? Are they close and root for each other to succeed? Yes, they're close. They're both very good, decent people. Harlan Barnett is a wonderful person. I don't know anyone that doesn't love Harlan Barnett. Gets along with everybody. Uh, They worked really well together as co-defensive coordinators for a couple years, which is not easy to do. Now they are assistant coaches, position coaches. Barnett technically is co-defensive coordinator, but he's not really co-defensive coordinator. That's all Scotty Hazleton. It's my understanding that uh, Barnett's co-defensive coordinator because that helped him contractually with the Florida State contract to get out and for compensation to be all correct for him to be a co-defensive coordinator here. That's what I heard. I don't know. Heard that from one good source. I haven't really confirmed it with others, but I feel strongly enough about it to put it out here. So, yeah, great relationship. Can they get it playing like 18? 2018, what did they do? Was that the year they went 10-3 and three and won the Holiday Bowl? That defensive backfield was good, right? Um I don't remember it being great. Was it great? Josiah Scott missed the year, correct? I don't know. But yeah, short answer, they can get the defensive backfield being, it can be as good as their ability should enable them to be. In other words, they're not, they will not, they won't, um, they won't underachieve. You know, they don't have a, they don't have Darquez Denard and Trey Waynes at corner. So you, you can only be so good. But last year, I thought the defensive backfield was not as good as they could have been. Paul Haynes did what he could. You, you saw missed, too many missed assignments, too many miscommunications. Every week basically ended up being. So they'll be better than that. They lose Josiah Scott, their most talented defensive back. So it's hard to be better when you're losing your best guy, an NFL draft pick. But collectively, there should be more cohesion. You know, you're looking at, you know, is it time for Kalen Gervin to take a step? Can... Uh, you know, Shakur, you know, Shaq Brown, you know, he was okay last year. Xavier Henderson is a junior, ready to become a solid player. Trey Person is a player that I think could improve and become more accountable. Has had some good moments in his career, and he's also, you know, had some thin ice moments. Type of guy that with Barnett and Tressel on him on a regular basis could have a good senior year. You know, Dominic Long's going to get a look, six one. All kinds of speed, good frame. Dominic Long and Kalen Gervin, you know, two different type of players. One's a big corner, not been on the field. One's more of a little guy that started against Ohio State and struggled. They've got some ability, though. Can Barnett get something out of those guys? One of those two guys, Long and Gervin, I would expect Barnett to have a good impact on them. But, geez, it would have been nice. Do people still say geez? Geez? This might be a 70s Midwestern thing. But it would have been nice for Michigan State's point of view and Gervin's point of view and Dominic Long's point of view if Harlan Barnett could have gotten his hands on those guys during spring football, molded them for 15 practices, had a green-white game, and then told them what 
he wanted them to do during the summer and then begin revisiting it to get back to work in August. Instead, right now is the first time that Barnett's gotten on the field with those guys. And beginning on Friday, they will have a football on the field. So the um, because we know so much about Barnett and Tressel, I believe that they've got the ability to make do a lot of good work with these DBs. But because the schedule has been upset so much, I, I really don't have a frame of reference on how well that's going to take, whether they can you can get the full Barnett impact on these guys not having had a spring season. All right, let's go over here to... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let people know on Twitter that we've got this nonsense going on. And... Sorry about the delay. Somebody always tells me I need to get somebody like Sully on the Rogan show. I appreciate that uh, that suggestion. Sully's not available, though. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that could help us out, but also the room I'm in is not big enough for social distancing. I don't really have a... I don't have glass in here. I guess we could have that, right? I don't really have... Um, and we're doing this late at night. I don't know if we want all these people in my office here. I, I wouldn't mind if there's people upstairs that might not want. Ah, they wouldn't mind it either. But some of you might not want to be around here with all the stuff going on. Question three from Chris P. in Metro Detroit. He says, there's a rumor of a Power 5 split uh, on this board at SpartanMag.com. I've read it in other spots that there are talks of Further consolidation of the four conferences. In the Jim Comproni dream world, what two to four teams would you like to see join the Big Ten? Once again, thanks to Old Tuck for the sponsorship earlier in the show. Appreciate that. Um, wow, talking conference realignment again. I haven't had that in a few years. You know, there's talk about this, and rumors about a Power Five split, and our guy Nils goes by the name Amy on the message boards posted over at the Final Forum message board. Untitled Beer Ranking Show, ring the bell. The $5 sponsorship, appreciate that, Untitled Beer Ranking Show. Let me know, Untitled Beer Ranking Show, whenever you sample the John Lemon Mead out of St. Ambrose Brewery in beautiful Beulah, Michigan, located on the shores of Crystal Lake, about five miles from the shoreline of Lake Michigan, John Lemon Mead. All right, so I'll have to get to Untitled Beer Ranking Show's question here in a second. Um, Yeah, you know, Nils was talking about, Amy was talking about, from a basketball point of view, there's talk about shrinking all that down to just the major heavyweights, you know, 65 teams, you know, the major conference teams, plus Gonzaga and a few others. I think that'd be a mistake. I think you have to have the 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 multi. Let's see, you got to ring the bell for Don Ramiro too. Comp, Don Ramiro. I'm not familiar with that one, but I'll take your word for it. All right, there we go. I'll do that for you. Um, I think you have to have the Maryland, Baltimore counties, the Middle Tennessee states. Sorry, the. Uh, who else has had big upsets? I mean, Loyola going to the Final Four, George Mason going to the Final Four, VCU. I, I, you need that in the NCAA tournament. Oh, Ron Ramiro gave $5? Oh, Don Ramiro. Don Ramiro, is that my guy? $5 sponsorship, Don Ramiro. Thank you, Don Ramiro. Don Ramiro, is that my guy? Is that my... Is that my, is that my avocado kingpin guy? The guy with the avocado family? Don Ramiro Bruss Press, is that you? Say yes, Don Ramiro, is that you? Don Ramiro. I know a guy named Ramiro, his last name starts with an F. I haven't talked to him in a long time. Yep, that's him. Um, I mean... Big Ten, obviously, Notre Dame is is one that you want to have. I'm not sure if that's ever going to be possible. They're just, both sides are too stubborn. You know, back in the old days, 
you know, maybe 10 years ago, there was talk about, you know, Notre Dame and Texas coming in. Then Notre Dame got that deal with the ACC. Then Texas ended up, um, you know, staying with the Big 12 because it looked like the Big 12 was going to disintegrate. But Notre Dame and Texas are big key pin players. Texas, in my opinion, is a cultural misfit. They'll come in with their big hat and their big boots thinking they own the place. Don't need that in the Big Ten. I respect what they are. Don't need that in the Big Ten. You know, uh, back uh, you know, back when the ACC looked like they were going to um, fall apart, you know, North Carolina was out there, possibly Virginia from a, from a money standpoint. North Carolina, I think, is a sleeping giant in football, kind of. They've got some football players available to them, just not sure if they'll ever get that support administratively to surpass basketball. I mean, basketball is big there. Can you, Will they al- allow the leeway to to keep their next great coach and not let a Mac Brown go to Texas? I don't know. But, you know, that Jordan Brand stuff does carry a lot of weight. They're recruiting really well right now. Not that far away. But the ACC is not letting any of those schools go. Once Maryland left, they had to re-up, circle the wagons, and they made everybody sign that killer contract. I think that um, everybody in the ACC, if you leave the ACC, you also leave your TV rights for 20 years or something like that. Um, in other words, no, none of those teams in the ACC can leave because their TV contracts are tied up with Atlantic Coast Conference. That's how they got everybody to do the Blood Brothers swear pledge to stay in the conference. So I don't think North Carolina is available. I don't think Virginia is available. Virginia would be good from an academic prestige standpoint in terms of quality of athletic department. You're getting another Maryland, so that wouldn't be great. But academics-wise... North Carolina and Virginia would be similar to the Big Ten in some ways. They don't have the greatest um, pasts in some ways. I mean, North Carolina, with that academic fraud thing, that was ridiculous. Um, and I don't know. You know, when you're, at, when you're at Syracuse and you walk around campus, it feels like a Big Ten school. The first time I went there, I expected it to be more of an East Coast feel, but it's not. It feels like, feels like Penn State. feels like... Feels like a Big Ten school, but again, ACC team not available. And you know, when the Big Ten expands, if they ever do, if you go down to four mega conferences or something, at that point, you know, it'll it'll be getting. You know, you didn't bring. They could have had Syracuse instead of Maryland or Rutgers. They went for Rutgers. History may prove that they went the wrong direction on that one. They wanted the, the New Jersey television sets. But. Right now, those with everybody cutting the cord, that history might not look kindly upon that decision. So you, you do Syracuse instead of so you do Rutgers instead of Syracuse. You know, Doug Weaver, the former Michigan State athletic director, always felt that Kentucky had more in common with Big Ten schools and the Big Ten than it had with the SEC. But Kentucky's a little stained, in my opinion, also. And, you know, no one's leaving the SEC that doesn't want to. Mark Hollis always kind of liked Missouri more so than the Eastern choices, but Missouri snapped up by the SEC. So there's other schools that would have fit. Notre Dame, if they do anything, it'll be ACC. It's a great question. I don't have any good answers. But if if they do break down and go to and consolidate from a power five to a power four, and I don't don't know. I've not quite heard that. I mean, a lot of people think that it's just going to be a 64-team national super conference thing. And and when that happens, I'm not sure if the conferences will remain, you know, with, with, uh, you know, autonomous and also competing with one another, which I'm not sure is great. The conference that's most likely to blow up is probably the Big 12, right? And if that's the case, Texas and Oklahoma become free agents. Could Texas and Oklahoma both go to the Pac-12 or come to the Midwest? Could one go and the other go? Would Oklahoma Oklahoma State come to the Big Ten? Texas, and I don't know. Texas Tech go to the Pac-12? Not sure. Notre Dame might be available. Hard to say, but man, that's that's putting the car way in front of the horse. I'm just daydreaming on that. I've not heard anything, not seen any credible reports on that. Question number five from Mile High from Golden, Colorado. Thanks a lot, guys. Sorry I lost my composure there a little bit. A little bit of live TV here, but Brez Prez. Um, He's fought back off the ropes pretty pretty well. He had some uh, 
some he had a had some rough cards dealt his way. He's been fighting off the ropes real nice. Um, anyway, Mile High from Golden, Colorado says, um, thanks for all you do, comp. Hope everyone is safe and healthy. Basketball question. With the commitment of Brooks Bates, assuming he reclassifies, and Christy, can you comment on the 21 recruiting class goals? Does it look like Michigan State is still planning to take five players in the class with Aikens remaining as the primary focus? And one of the two of Thompson and Boachi, if he reclassifies the remaining targets. Um, we've already talked about that a little bit. And yes, I think, you know, they're looking for Boachi, Bates, Aiken to go with Brooks. That gives them four. Am I missing somebody? It seems like there's a Oh, and Christie would give them five. And that would be a crazy five man class. That'd be a crazy good five man class. Crazy good five-man class. I mean, Bates, you know him. Christie, you know him. Brooks, it's going to be a solid four-year guy, program guy. Aikens, Mad Leaper, Ball Skills, and Boachi. 6'10", well-proportioned. When you look at Boachi, he doesn't look 6'10". He doesn't look like he has a 7'6 wingspan. He doesn't look like he's got a seven-foot wingspan because he's so well-proportioned. Usually guys with that type of wingspan when they're 17 look like a praying mantis, right? This guy looks physically mature. But, you know, so did Matty Sissoko. So did Julius Marble. You're just, you know, a lot of these guys are seem to be maturing earlier. Marcus Bingham, not quite the same way. Bingham needed to redshirt. And if he were going into his redshirt sophomore year right now, his future would look better. But he wanted to play, and that was not a good decision. All right, let's go over here to the chat area. Rob South says, what's up, fellas? Old Tuck. Rob South and Old, F- old Tuck. Old, would I almost call you a bad word, Old Tuck? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, they always have, uh, they're, they're, they're the first here and the last ones to leave. That makes, that's what makes a good practice player. The first one's here, the last one's to leave. Old Tuck, the bell cow is here. Rob South is the big toe. Hayden Vischer says, digging the shirt, cop. Can't wait for some baseball this season. Got my Tiger shirt on. Got the old English D. Tell you what, man, I was watching some baseball yesterday. It was Sunday. Got home from a baseball tournament that finished up really well. We didn't place or anything, but it was our first tournament. We're kind of a sandlot. A little bit of a ragtag crew, and the guys came together. We were a little too excited in game one, threw the ball around a little bit too much. Game two finished better. Game three came out and pulled a nice upset and played well. Did some good things. Had some good young players make some strides. They felt good about themselves. And I felt a great sense of accomplishment because we started getting on the field around June 5th when things started to open up in the state, and we were rusty. Those guys hadn't seen each other. They're all from the same high school. And they hadn't seen each other since March. So it was a big deal for them to get on the field together in June. And I coached them for two weeks. And they never once asked, who are we playing? When are we playing? They were just happy to be out there practicing. And it was fun. And it was good. That game was good. Came home. I mean, we had to play at 8 in the morning in Whitmore Lake outside of Ann Arbor. So we had to leave here at five, you know, 6.30 in the morning. Woke up at 5.30 in the morning. It was a long day. And it was hot. Hot weekend. And to have a sense of accomplishment, guys playing well and having fun. We're not, we don't put pressure on them to win. We, we try to motivate them to win and have fun pursuing that. But no big deal. It's low pressure for sure. I'm, I, don't, I want these guys to love baseball, right? I want them to be good baseball dads someday. Hopefully I'm doing that for them. So uh, we won that game, felt great, came home tired, and it was 11 in the morning. Tired, hot, had some lunch. And the Mets were playing the Yankees on TV. Hadn't seen a major league, like a live major league baseball game in forever. So the combination of a great sense of accomplishment Sunday and then seeing that on TV just, I mean, felt great. Felt great. Not sure if the Tigers will do much, but they'll have a couple of young players we'll keep an eye on, and that's going to be starting on Thursday. Wish we could go to watch some games this year. I know in Lansing they've got the Lemonade League, trying to make lemons out of lemonade out of lemons or whatever. I think they're only allowing 100 people in to watch those games. And I think it's just college kids from around here. They're putting them together on some makeshift teams. I don't think they're playing for anything in particular, but I might go over there and check out some games. They're only 
allowing 100 people in there. But when you're outside, especially a day game, I'm not a medical expert, but apparently if you're outside in the sun, in the air, distanced, should be safe. And we didn't go headlong into the into the travel baseball thing. Other teams did. Other teams were ready to play tournaments from the beginning, like the first week of June. We were just starting practice, very gradual. The hand sanitizer, the distancing, five players, then seven players. Parents were okay with it. I, you know, if you, we're going to be out there, if you want us to join, we'll do it. So we put together a team. Um, you know, you you see what, what the tests say, what the what the science says, what about people under the age of eighteen? I think I saw that there hasn't been one fatality in the state of California of anyone under the age of eighteen from the virus. Um, the flu is worse for young people. I'm not an expert on these things. I mean, uh, it's it's more of a, of a problem for the coaches than it is the players. We all firmly believe that. So it's a, it's a, it's a deal. Do you want them to stay home and not see each other, not see their friends for seven months? And the, you know, what kind of long-term impact, negative impact could that have on young people? Or do you want to put them out there and let them play some baseball? That's what we did. And we all feel that's the, it was good for them. Um, But we waited because other tournaments were going on in June for weeks. And I've not heard any negative, anything negative, any, any problems with that nationwide with club baseball. So we went ahead and more practices and played. So, um, well, why was I starting to talk about that? There was there was something that brought back a point about college football. Oh, about the Lemonade League over in, in Lugnuts. I would go into the Lugnuts Stadium and watch that. Wouldn't be around anybody to have a mask on, and I would feel, knock on wood, I'd feel okay. I mean, I went to Rite Aid today. I think that's more of a risk than going to an open-air baseball park. And as far as football goes, we'll get a question here at some point. What I what you know what I think the chances are that Michigan State plays or that there's college football this year. Here in the Midwest right now, things are positive. People are playing baseball. Michigan State's playing. Everybody's having negative tests. Everybody in Ann Arbor, the Wolverines, negative tests. Everything in the Midwest, at least in Michigan right now, it's not great, but it reminds me of the way things were in the South two months ago. When they were all like, hey, man, everything's fine. Of course there's going to be college football. Now the South's being hit hard. Um, and maybe that changes their viewpoint on things. When I listen to talk shows like Mark Packer and some of the, the shows from the South, um, they're not as optimistic, whereas people around here are more optimistic. But once we get into the fall and people in the Midwest and in Michigan go back indoors, again, I'm not an expert, but I suspect that's when we're going to have more transmission uh of it again i would think i'm knocking on wood because i respect um those that have battled it and i'm not looking forward to getting it myself but young people are the demographic that seems to be in good shape on this whole thing and college football is played by young people and there's a lot of people a lot of athletic departments that would love to stage college football and there's a lot of players that would love to play and they happen to be in the safest demographic so can those dots get connected and some semblance of football be played this fall the optics would not be good in some regards but um when it comes down to this i think the players those that want to play and there will be some players that won't want to play and i respect that and it sounds like most schools and most conferences will honor the scholarships of those players, theoretically, if there's a football season and there's some players that don't want to play. Um, And if they don't want to play, that's respectable. But if if it's a voluntary thing where players play if they want to play, in my opinion, that mitigates the optics. Yes, the athletic departments are doing it to pay the bills and to keep cash flow going. Business is business. Optics, schmoptics. At that point, I think that as football, Seth Foreman, 99 cents. Back in the old days, that would have bought me a Reggie bar. (laughs) I appreciate it, man. Thanks, Seth. Appreciate all the sponsorships. 
Um, I always lose my train of thought when, when a sponsorship rolls in, but we appreciate them. Anyway, the, I, so if there's, if um, it had to do with whether or not they, they, if I think they might play, I don't know. No one knows. But this is what I was going to say. With Major League Baseball starting and with uh, NBA getting going in the bubble, NHL is going to go fine in Canada, I think, because everything is clean up in Canada. They're going to be in two hub cities, and they'll be fine. There'll be some tests here and there that test positive, and then those great athletes will sit out for two weeks and come back. And so far, every great athlete that has had a problem or that has tested positively is, is just sat out for two weeks, and it's not been a big deal. For me, it would be a big deal, I think. I wouldn't be able to shake it off like those great athletes do. Who is the defensive end, Vaughn, what's his name, and Super Bowl MVP? He had a little bit of problem with it, but he had um, a uh, pre-existing condition. He's asthmatic and older. He's 30 and he's asthmatic. All right, Hayden Visher. I missed Hayden. Ring the bell for Hayden Visher. Thanks, Hayden. Untitled Beer Ranking Show says, I'll help you comp. It won't be a problem doing it from a distance. Let's talk later. I think he's talking about the John Lemon Mead. Hayden Visher. Yep, happy Monday, Hayden Visher. Sponsorship, appreciate you, Hayden. Appreciate Untitled Beer Ranking Show. Appreciate Seth Foreman and Old Tuck and my guy Ramiro. All right, so I'm going to have to get going again here a little bit. I've been knocked off the rails a few times. All right, so Mile High also says, you've also made comments recently about negative recruiting going on against Izzo at Michigan State. Well, it was worse 10 years ago. I don't know if there's as much as there used to be. He says, do you care to comment on who is going down that path? What is being said? It's not really schools that are doing it. It's, and he asks whether this played into the Aiken, into Aikens slowing things down. Well, I mean, you can see with Aikens, it was a it was a point on the message board a couple of days ago with Jordan Crawford. I mean, he's one, he's not the guy, but you know, he's on very busy on Twitter, saying things about Izzo holding back players, and you know, Jordan Crawford, former Indiana player from Detroit, Michigan State didn't recruit him. That was a topic on the message board today. So guys like that that are going to hate on Izzo, hate on Michigan State, you know, that goes all the way back to, was it, who was the guy that went to Notre Dame, little point guard? Remember, he was saying that he didn't think Michigan State would let him get his boogie on. Remember that? Well, he didn't come up with that concept on his own. And he became an assistant coach in the college ranks. And he regrets saying that, and he became more mature and, and realized more what Michigan State had to offer. But when people are in your ear and they're anti-Michigan State, it can be hard to recruit against that. Why are people in the ear of these guys? Because back then, Michigan State wasn't, you know, they weren't doing, doing deals with those guys. Some of those guys that were doing that are no longer the kingpins that they were back then. Anyway. Let's go back to the chat area. All right. Old Tuck says, Lake Michigan comp got to be number one in your rankings now. Chinook are hitting, and so are the Browns. The brown trout. The Chinook salmon. You know what? That's a good point about Lake Michigan with the salmon. That's a plus. That's a plus. It's a big plus. Lake Michigan, I've not... Done the rankings in a while. I was at Lake Michigan a couple weeks ago. It's beautiful. Um, got a soft spot in my heart for Lake Huron because the people are so great over there. It's different over there. They only have the dunes because the the uh, you know the jet stream, the west, the westerly wind, and the tides puts the sand over here more so than here. But if you go on this part of Lake Huron, the Canadian part of Lake Huron, you'll get dunes. That's your geology for today. Is that geology? I don't know what that I don't know what category that is. But what I'm trying to say is Lake Huron is the underrated lake of the five. And I got some heat from someone else about the lakes coming up in the mailbag. All right. Untitled Beer Ranking Show says, what's up, fellas? Hayden Fisher says, any media available starting Friday? And I mentioned that earlier in the show. I'm hoping that we'll get some some 
maybe a, a Zoom press conference with Mel Tucker Friday. I've not heard anything. Like I said, I reached out to uh, Ben Flieger and asked him about it and have not heard back from him. Hoping we can talk to the coach because I'm sure he's got some thoughts on some individuals. You know, when we've spoken with Mel Tucker, it's been about big picture items, the campus, the conference, the schedule, the history. And I'm sure he's dying to learn more about these individuals. Now that he's seen the individuals more, it would be interesting to hear what he has to say about some of those players. Rob South is the big toe. Mr. Bone Man checking in. Bradley Cruz says, hey, guys, thanks for all your hard work. Jim, love the vids. Go green. Thanks, Bradley. Good to get that support from you. Justin then nailed that pronunciation on Boachi. Thanks, Justin. You're the one that taught me that pronunciation. Thanks. Jim McCarthy says, things looking good with Enoch Boachi. Yes, they are. Talked about that earlier. Gordon Tenono says, did the punter from Australia decommit? And I've not heard that. I'll have to look into that. I've not heard that. There's been some buzz about that a little bit, but we will look into that. Those Australian punters are starting to get... If this one decommits, we start start being kind of strange if that happens again. He went back home, Rob South says. You're talking about Bo Meester. He's the one that... He didn't decommit. He was here for a year and went back home. You're not talking about Crawford, the guy that transferred in from UTEP. Was there another one? I don't think there was another one. Maybe Tenona was talking about Bo Meester. Yeah, he went back home. He was homesick. Mr. Bone Man says hello from Harper Woods. Gordon Tenona, what college did Montgomery transfer from? Oh, that was a question last week. Gordon Tenona says Penn State. Gordon Tenona knows his punters, apparently. He knows his punters. You know, I did not know that about Greg Montgomery. Uh, he was part of the Rose Bowl team here in 1987, All-American punter, punted for the Houston Oilers, I think it was. I'm going to get a Houston Oilers mini helmet, by the way. I like to get NFL like helmets that don't, they're up there, that don't, that uh, were, were discontinued. Like, I loved this one. I loved this one when I was a kid, right? The old Rams one. And I bought this when it, you didn't see it anymore. That's more of a darker blue. Then the Rams moved back to Los Angeles and you started seeing it more, which I liked. But when they were in St. Louis, the, the, the color of the Ram thing was wrong. Wrong. And bad for football. So that was a discontinued helmet that came back. Houston Oilers, I got to get that one next. So Montgomery, I didn't know that Montgomery transferred from Penn State. Now that you say that, that rings a bell. That's something that I once knew but forgot. But last week here on Spartan Mag Live, somebody asked that question. From what school did Greg Montgomery transfer? And I didn't know the answer. Someone stumped me on that one, so good for you guys. And thanks to Gordon Tenona, our resident um, punting groupie expert for bringing that to our attention. Old Tuck says Ms. Linsky could be a Toby Heaton type of guy, flexible ankles, etc. I'm not sure Toby Heaton had the most flexible ankles, but he had a great sense of humor. Toby Heaton, offensive lineman from the early 90s. Those of you that are new to the program and the community here, Old Tuck all, uh, frequently compares a newcomer Spartan to somebody from the early 90s. Toby Heaton had a great quote in the early 90s. I remember the great Jack Ebling did a story about, the, about Toby Heaton and uh, made a point about Ohio offensive linemen, because I think at that point, maybe four of Michigan State's starting offensive linemen were from the state of, of Ohio. Ebling asked Toby Heaton why that was. You know, why are the Ohio guys these good big offensive linemen? And Toby Heaton's like, I don't know. When we're little, maybe they throw manure on us or something. That's a great quote from Toby Heaton back from 1993. Don't ask me why I remember that, but that's a good quote. Old Tuck says, answer to last week's trivia, Greg Montgomery started his punting career at Penn State. I didn't know that, or I'd forgotten it, or I forgot that I forgot it. Justin Thin says, regarding Ms. Linsky, rivals Southeast analyst Rob Cassidy is responsible for his two-star rating. He has made up his mind on Mike and refuses to listen to him or anyone else. Okay, so Justin, Justin, 
talking some trash. Okay. But yeah, if if they've already seen, you know, the film has been seen, and at at six foot three, he is what he is, and I think he looks pretty good. But if someone already thinks that he's got limitations, that's probably not going to change. So, what Ms. Linsky needs to do is go somewhere and be all conference, and um, that'll be that. But two star, that's some tough grading. Like I said last time, Michigan State signed a two star. It was Matt Allen. He'll be a three year starter this year. Solid. Needs to take it up another notch capable of doing it. Cameron Trigg says, Enoch Boachi is committing on July 28th. Do you think he picks Michigan State, and do you think he will reclassify? Yes, I think he's going to pick Michigan State. Yes, I think he's going to reclassify, and thank you to Justin Thin for steering me correctly on that. And even if that ends up being wrong, I'm okay with that. because Justin does a great job getting information, and I trust it. That's why he's on the, on the team here at SpartanMag.com. Question number six from the mailbag. Hayden V. from Grand Rapids. He's here right now, too. Thanks to Hayden. He says, what's your honest opinion? To-? All right, this gets back to what we were talking about a minute ago. What's your honest opinion today that Michigan State plays a season this fall, a football season? What's the Jim Comproni percentage it gets moved to the spring? Um, I think there's going to be football this fall. You know, I, I, you know, I heard Stout talking today, like, mm-hmm. it says you can't just doesn't look like it's heading that way. Um, Packer and others, Feinbaum still. A lot of that might depend on what TV station you're watching. I've not watched enough news lately. I just think that science is going to show, or it is showing, that the athletes are safe and they want to play. And there's big money that wants them to play. Can you connect those dots? The optics will look bad. There may be some schools that can't do it. UCLA is not going to have any students on campus. How can you ask ask people to play football when you're not letting students students on campus? Maybe UCLA doesn't have a team. But um, as you know, the ones in the south are the ones most likely to want to play because, as you know, down south it just means more. But right now as we get closer to camp – oh, I think I just messed up the microphone. Let me know if it's still – if it's okay. As we get closer to camp time, I'm having trouble with this thing. I'm not quite, I don't quite have the hookups of Howard Stern here. But as we get closer to August camp time, um, the SEC is the part of the country. Thanks, Hayden. Sounds good. The SEC is the part of the country that's having the hardest time with this. So, yes, it just means more. And they were hell-bent and determined to have a college football season back in June. They were leading the charge in that direction. But right now, they're the ones having the tough time. So if there's any conference that would fight through it, it would be them, but they're having to fight through the most as of now. I just think that, you know, on Friday, they're going to be getting their, uh, you know, enhanced camp portion of the summer with the footballs and conditioning, I think they'll go through that. And at Michigan State, they will continue to test cleanly. I think they will at at Michigan and some other places. I think it's easier to test clean here because students are not on campus yet, and it's not a big metropolitan area, so the players don't have a lot to do. They're amongst themselves. There's been a little bit of a spike in Columbus here and there. Columbus is a bigger city, more to do. There's a spike in Miami. Miami's a huge city, great things to do there. So keeping those players, you know, um, within a bubble at those places is harder to do. I just think as we get toward ju- in, in deeper into July, I think the people here will be okay. And then you'll start mixing them more if you get to camp in early August. Um, and then you, you'll have some positive tests. And the question is, what do you do when you've got 10 or 12 or 14 positive tests? Clemson just sits people out. And they keep practicing, keep practicing. And then apparently they just bring them back in and keep moving forward. They've had the most positive tests that we've known about, and they've never stopped. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. So, I don't know. In my opinion, it, for in that age group, it's not as scary as it was in April and May. And there's people that want to make money, sadly or not, that money's a factor in this. But... The kids, the college players, they want to play. Some of these guys are only going to be a senior once. They want to play. Not everybody, and those that don't, don't have to. The optics. 
Well, the optics look better as Major League Baseball begins, and you'll have some positive tests, and people sit out, like in golf or MMA or NASCAR. Jimmy Johnson and NASCAR sat out, came back. In baseball, you'll have some of that, and they'll just sit out, and they'll come back. Knock on wood, you hope that no one has a serious problem, but the statistics show that there will be very few serious problems, maybe zero. I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. I'm just giving a theoretical. If baseball comes back and does well, hockey comes back and does well, NBA comes back and does well, then can college football ride on those coattails? I realize college football players are not professionals. That's where the optics questions come in. It would look bad, some people think. But some people think the college, the college football sports model already looks bad. I'm not sure the NCAA has always been altered by optics. They want to look good, but I don't know. NFL comes back. There's, a, there's been some some blustering between the players and the NFL here in recent days about players being upset that they're not getting enough communication from the NFL about what they want to do to provide, um, you know, safe protocols, testing, and those things. It seems like college, the college teams are way ahead of the NFL in communication about what they want to do and what they did do than it's going on in the NFL. But if NFL comes back, they'll have some positive tests. People leave and come back. I think I'm saying if all those things are going well, what did the Big Ten do by canceling the non-conference games? They bought some time. They also saved some money. You don't have to pay Toledo $1.5 million. Um, in other schools, they don't have to pay visitors $1.5 million, $1.2 million, $1.9 million. That money usually comes out of the ticket sales. Well, there's no ticket sales, so let's just save $2 million and not play those games, firstly. Secondly, you can stay a little bit more of a bubble by not doing as much traveling, stay in the Midwest. Thirdly, if you have a situation where you've got, theoretically, if you're playing a season and you have too many positive tests and the other team does also, you're all in the same business together as Big Ten schools. It'd be more agile, more ability there would be more ability to just move a game from October 5th to December 5th or to a bye weekend because you're all in the same business in the Big Ten. So it made sense for them to chop off those non-conference games. It also gives them a chance to delay the season into late September. And what will you know by late September? If you've only practiced amongst yourselves and your players have maybe contracted the virus through campus activity with other students, there will be some of that. Not as much of that because half of their classes are going to be online and half the students are just are going to be online. And there's not going to be... I, I'm hearing the cafeterias on campus, the dormitory camp, the cafeterias, they will not be open. You will be eating in your own dorm room. It's not going to be a great campus atmosphere for freshmen whether you be a general student population or an athlete, I feel bad for them. 2020 sucks that way, right? But I don't, but I, to the point, I don't know if there's going to be a lot of positive tests. And that's at Michigan State, and I think it could be that way at other Big Ten schools. And if you're able to go through training camp in August and things are delayed through September, you get to September 15th. And let's say Major League Baseball is two and a half months into it with no problems. And NBA is two months into it with little or no problems. NHL is two months into it with little or no problems. Then could the optics look better for college football, biding their time, kicking the can down the road? And then do we know more about vaccines and treatment at that point? September 20th, maybe things will look good. I don't know. Maybe I'm naive. Right now, you turn on TV, and it looks really bad in a lot of places. I don't mean to discount that at all. I'm just... Just thinking out loud. All right, so um, let's wrap this up. I don't. Well, let's see. I've got a few more questions here. Uh, class of two thousand six from God's Country. Who's looking good at the camp workouts? Who maybe didn't do their job during the lockdowns and self workouts? That's what class of two thousand six wants to know. Two thousand six. I don't know. Haven't heard anything yet about the workouts I have not gotten any word out of those yet question number eight dr green and white from howell michigan says if imani bates does reclassify in 2021 and actually comes to michigan state 
What happens if the NBA does not change the draft age rule? My take is that he would be in East Lansing for two years, even though that sounds crazy. Furthermore, what is the mechanism to even change this rule since the NBA collective bargaining agreement runs through 2024? Why would the NBA owners agree to this change when only one team will get Bates and the other, the others will have to contend with him? Okay, we talked a little bit about this earlier. You know, I... I, th- I understand the two-year thing with Bates, but I think one year is going to be enough to look to expand his horizons after one year. But I hear what you're saying. He still wouldn't have the age requirement to go to the NBA, but he would have the age requirement to go to the G League. Plus, I think the G League would waive the rule a year before that anyway. So one year at Michigan State, I think, is all you can hope for. His bonus question, he says, My freshman year at Michigan State, Paul Edinger lived across the hall from me on the fifth floor of Holden Hall, but I never really talked to him because I was a total nerd. Okay, I respect that, Dr. Green and White from Howell, Michigan. Edinger, and you know, by the way, Edinger was kind of a nerd too. But he was, he, he, but he had great ability to punt and kick, which is, it's not as common as you would think to be able to do both at the Big Ten level. And Edinger hit the game winner against Florida in the Citrus Bowl in 1991. January 1st, 2000, Y2K, Edinger ushered it in. Money beating his home state Gators. I say that um, with respect that Edinger was a nerd. Anyway, tell me, uh, by the way, Dr. Green and White, if Edinger's ever had a girlfriend come up from Florida. Why would I ask something like that? I don't know. I was 28, 29 back then. Not too creepy, I don't think, but. One day, we were sitting there as sports writers, just waiting for players to come by, waiting for players to come by. We're going to interview players. You know, I've requested Cedric Irvin and Ike Reese or something. <clears throat> and Edinger walks by with what we think is his girlfriend. And we all looked at each other, and we're like, Edinger's a boss. Again, I was probably 27 at the time. Now it would be too creepy. I'm too old to be doing that. But... Anyway, let me know if you ever caught wind of any of that in, in Holden Hall, Mr. Dr. Green and White. Matt in Grand Rapids says, Have you heard any rumblings on how ADs plan to handle the lost non-conference games for 2020? No, I've not. That's from Matt in Grand Rapids, originally from Lake Fenton. Now he lives in Lake Fenton, originally from Flint. Lake Fenton, what are they, the Blue Devils? He says, do you think we will see a uniform approach by the conferences or will individual universities be responsible to cancel and reschedule? I think individual universities will have to do that and that's going to be a tangled web. Mm, And, you know, I don't know. All right, got to move on here. Okay, last question. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, but I don't remember who this was from, but he's going to give me some heat on my... Great Lakes rankings. And most recently, the power rankings had Lake Huron still number one. Lake Michigan, the favorite, the superpower, knocking on the door at number two. I think I had had Lake Ontario three. Did I have Lake Erie three? It's kind of a... I had Lake Erie number three as a... Kind of a Cinderella thing. I know Lake Erie is not as clean, but it's warm in the spring because it's shallow. And it's the walleye capital of the world. And I've got a lot of friends there on the Canadian side. Lake Ontario is pretty cool. I'm not going to kid you. I had Lake Superior number five because there were reports that whoever is in charge of letting the water out of Lake Superior, that'd be an interesting political cartoon, they're letting too much water out of Lake Superior. And that's why down here these other lakes and rivers have too much water coming in. It's not always about, I don't know if that's glacier melt way up there. I, the report said it's not coming in from the St. Lawrence Seaway. It's coming in from Lake Superior, and it's it's regulated there. And that's where they're letting the water out. So if they kept more in there, would they have more erosion up there? I don't know. But you know what's going on in Lake Michigan. I mean, that erosion's a, a problem there. It's a problem Mackinac Island right now. I was there a couple weeks ago, you know, where you ride your bike around the circumference of the island, 9 miles or 8.9 miles, 8.8, whatever it is. Um, the northern side of the 
island is off limits for biking. You can only go to the eastern point over to the Mission Point area and then back around and up to the top where British Landing is. But almost half of it, you can't ride your bikes around there because of erosion and they're doing work up there. Anyway, Lake Superior, it's all your fault. I know it's beautiful, but it's all your fault. That's why you're not higher in the rankings. I know it's beautiful, it's wilderness, hockey country. I respect all of that. But I'm putting him on probation there for a little bit. But the question from this guy, and I forgot to write down his name. He says, a qu- he says first of all, a question on your, Great Lakes, on your Great Lakes rankings. And he's not happy about this. He says, when were you last on Lake Superior? He says, I spent some time in Munising and Marquette lately on Lake Superior. Sorry, but there is nothing on Lake Huron that compares to the natural beauty, power, and majesty exhibited by Lake Superior at Pictured Rocks at Munising. There it is. Very well said. And my guy Longfellow would agree with you. Um... My man, I, I detected some hostility in that post. I like that. I respect that. Pictured Rocks is great. Munising is great. And by the way, the Paul Bunyan trophy, he's got his axe. And he's got two feet. He's got his hands on his hips. Paul Bunyan trophy. Uh, he's got one foot in the Saginaw Bay, and the other foot is right around Munising, by the way. Just a little factoid in case you ever had a chance to look at the trophy up close. And you got to be hoping it's going to be in the Michigan State uh, football building in the near future. Maybe not this year. Anyway, <clears throat> he says, I love the Lake Michigan shoreline, Lexington, Tawas. He means the Lake Huron shoreline. Lexington, Tawas, Oscoda, Alpena, Sheboygan, etc. But they don't have the natural beauty and splendor of, that Lake Superior possesses. I think you need to reassess your rankings. Duly noted, I respect your viewpoint. I'm going by the people a little bit. I also like when you go up Lake Huron. It's not as touched. I've been battling allergies. We're going to have to shut off here in a second. It's You feel like it's that's probably the way it looked in 1960 or even 1955 with some of the old like motels that are still in existence up on US 23 going up that way. It's It's touristy, but it's not as touristy as the Lake Michigan side. Lake Michigan's beautiful, a little bit to, you know, the, the people don't mean to offend anybody, but in the Huron side, there's less pretense. I like the less pretentious people. Natural beauty, you're right. Lake Superior is different. The water's just bigger and darker and just moves different. You can just see that it is a sea. Big Sea Waters. Was it Hemingway or Longfellow that called it Big Sea Waters? I think it was Hemingway in... Up in Michigan, his short story, Big Sea Waters. It is Big Sea Water, Lake Superior. The rocky coastline. I've not been to Marquette in a while, but beautiful place. I don't disagree with you at all. And the trees just smell better the farther north you go. Lake Superior is going to rise again. I just got to look back into that. And I might post that article about that. It was published by... It was published in Canada, by the way, about that's what's flooding the Great Lakes or the, yeah, the lower Great Lakes. All right. He says, football question. Assuming we have a season or even a partial season and assuming everyone is healthy, who do you believe will be Michigan State's defensive starters? Well, that could be a podcast all by itself, but I had the depth. I wrote the depth chart in the Athlon's preview and hard to say. I mean, this was just educated guesses because the coaches, when I wrote this, didn't even know in March. But I had Jacob Panishuk starting at defensive end with defensive end with Drew Beasley. Drew Beasley is a senior walk on. He has started in the past. He's solid. He's functional. Defensive tackles. It's time for Naquan Jones and Jacob Slade to do it. Slade played a lot last year. Naquan Jones was good in the bowl game. That's your defensive line. Panishuk, Jones, Slade, Beasley, solid defensive line. Panishuk, can he take it up a notch and become a difference maker? Potentially. Naquan Jones. Now that he's the guy. 
Can he really ratchet it up? Is there a chance that Naquan Jones kind of was not, didn't have his pilot like totally on high, wasn't quite full throttle because he always knew he wasn't starting? Possibly. Now that it is his senior year, now that he is starting, is it possible that Naquan Jones could really turn the wick up? It's possible. Linebacker, I've got Antoine Simmons anywhere he wants. Got Noah Harvey in the middle. I got Chase Klein at outside linebacker. Could easily be just Lord Boateng. I'll go with Chase Klein. Defensive backfield, I got Shaq Brown. I have uh, Xavier Henderson and Trey Person at safety. No surprise there. Shaq Brown, no surprise there. And Kalen Gervin at the other corner, but it could be Dominic Long. So there's that. Let's get back to the to the um, chat area questions, and we'll wrap this thing up. Um, any updates on Jaden Akins? I, not that I've heard. You know, Michigan State still wants him. Could he make a decision after the after Enoch makes his? I'm not sure. You know, the longer you're in the lead, I've always said. It's not a good thing, but I've, I've not detected that as a negative yet with Aikens. Justin Thin says that he'd put it at 60%. He's talking about Bates and Enoch, I think. Mr. Bowman says, can we talk a little women's basketball and how is Coach Merchant's recruiting class looking? You know, you got me on that one. I'm not sure. I don't have the answers on that one. Wish I did, but I don't. But I appreciate your interest in women's basketball. If Ricardo Cooney were here, he could tell you. But you caught me on that one. I wasn't able to do the research on that. Kyle Tansel says, thanks for what you do, comp. Just curious what happened to wide receiver Julian Major and why did the highly recruited Noah Listerman disappear? You know, Listerman, if you've been on our message board and SpartanMag.com, when Listerman came to Michigan State, he was already committed and he did not look good at Michigan State's camp. He was tall. He was kind of narrow. He was thin. He was a project. He was going to have to put on some brawn. He, he wasn't physical. And, you know, he tried, and he was here for four years, but I was not shocked at all that he never got on the field. So um, that's an evaluation mistake. No disrespect to, to Noah Listerman. That is somebody that Michigan State shouldn't have taken a, a commitment from until he came to camp. And then after they saw him in camp, maybe they wouldn't have offered him. But there was some scuttlebutt that Ohio State was coming after him. And Michigan State went ahead and offered and got him, so Ohio State couldn't get him. Is there a chance that Ohio State faked like they wanted him in order to make Michigan State take him? I don't know. He was supposed to be athletic. I never quite saw that. Julian Major, um, you know, Matt Dorsey, when he, you know, Matt did a great job for us for a long time, and I talked to him last week, and it was great to hear from him. He's doing well. Good guy, smart guy. Dorsey was never high on Julian Major, and he'd heard from some of his contacts that Julian Major went to Penn State's camp and ran like a 4-9. Michigan State got a commitment from him, and I can't remember if he camped at Michigan State or not, but he came to Michigan State, and he lasted a, a couple of weeks, went home, came back, gave it another try in second semester, if I'm remembering right. Didn't last long, it went back. He just never had the ability. Again, evaluation error. Uh, Don, Dan, Don Romero, gas money for the PSU trip. More to come. <laughs> I get it now. That's the five dollars from the for the Penn State trip when he when we carpooled up there. That was me, Paul, the Brez Prez, and Jillian Van Strat was working for us back then. We went to Penn State, and there was a snowstorm. That was when Michigan State went was going for their first Big Ten title under D'Antonio. Went up to Penn State, lost pretty convincingly. That was when the program was just getting going. And, you know, it was Thanksgiving weekend, and it was getting, it was wet as we left. Southeast Michigan turned to snow when we were below Lake Erie. There's a little bit of a snow belt below Lake Erie there through Canton, through there, through Statesboro maybe, Ohio. Had the Statesboro Blues a little bit. And it started snowing pretty good. Forecast was saying four or five inches. I didn't want to be driving at two in the morning through the Pennsylvania Turnpike in five inches of snow. Because um, if you get sideways and hit a guardrail there in the turnpike, you're in the mountains, and ain't nobody going to come get you. So we just shut it down, got a hotel in Canton. Three rooms. I think me and Paul shared a room and uh, had time to kill. Went to Meyer, got some refreshments. 
Um, yeah, it was a good trip. And then got up early the next morning to go to Penn State. Um, it was probably another two and a half hours to State College, maybe three hours. And as we were driving early in the morning, there were semi-trucks. There were two semi-trucks that had jackknifed and hit a guardrail and were stranded from the night before. So we hit, we saw two of those. We saw some of the carnage from the night before. So it was a good decision to shut it down right then. The Penn State trip. It was a good one. All right. That's that's when I was having my breakdown. Sorry about that. Thanks for staying with me. It's embarrassing. I'll have to edit that out. Todd D. Is, let's see. Hope you're well, Don. Don Ramiro, good to be here, comp. You've been good to me. Thank you for the sentiments. Old Tuck says, I agree on Texas comp. I live here, and they are U of M of the South. I hear that. I got a friend that lives down there. Um... Anyway, I was trying to see from Duncanville. That's where the basketball player is from, but he's from around there. And he says the same thing. He doesn't like Texas because he doesn't like the arrogance. He's moved down there and became an Oklahoma fan. Just doesn't like the way the Texas thing, Texas vibe goes. Whatever. Old Tuck, paper champion, soft fans. Mike Bell says, how about U of M? They aren't Big Ten, are they? Uh, yeah, they are Big Ten. Jesse Adams says, Jesse from Mount Pleasant. It looks like Anthony, the wide receiver from East Lansing, is leaning toward Penn State more than MSU. But if he commits to Penn State, Will Mel, uh, we didn't get the rest of Jesse's post. Andrell Anthony, good wide receiver, East Lansing High School, top 15 player in the state of Michigan, high three star. Released his top four today, Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State, Notre Dame. Penn State recruiting well in the state of Michigan, and it's a thorn in the side for the Spartans and the Wolverines, more so the Spartans, I would say. Jesse Adams, uh, continuing his question he's, he's, his question here, says, if he commits to Penn State, will Mel keep going after him to flip him? Yes, I think Mel Tucker is going to keep recruiting a number of these players with the intention of trying to flip some of them. If Michigan State has a football season and a decent one, Maybe that can give them some juice to do that. But at this point, trying to flip somebody's a little bit futile because there's only so much you can do um, right now because you can't have visits, you can't have face-to-face -face contact. We talked about that last week. Uh, Jesse Adams says, because the last, the last staff would not try to flip guys who are committed to another school, even if the commit has MSU in his top schools. Also, can Ricky White get some playing time? Yes, Ricky White, talented wide receiver from Marietta, Georgia. He definitely could help the talent pool in wide receiver. And wide receiver is a position where you can help immediately. It's easier to help immediately. And Ricky White has got a good chance to be quite good. Mike Bell says, is Gibby the best wide out in Spartan history? Whoa. Whoa. That could be a whole podcast. You'll have to ask that next time. You know, I never saw Kurt Gibson play live. And I know I never saw him play on TV, not in college. The first time I saw Kurt Gibson play was in the Hula Bowl. I was a sixth grader, fifth grader. Um, I mean, I've looked at some of his film. Was it the game against, there's that one game where he catches it and he looks like Secretariat just chugging 20 yards ahead of everybody. I'd leave that up to some other people. I can't get into that one right now. I mean, there's been some good ones, right? Plaxico, Andre Risen, Ingram. Yeah, there's been some good ones. Gibson was, was, was good, and he was in an offense at the time when very few teams were airing it out like that. So you talk about it. He's a dominant wide receiver for a dominant offense. Seth Foreman says, I don't feel tardy. Van Halen reference, hopper, che hopper teacher. I got it. I got it. I brought my pencil. Give me something to write on, man. All right. Seth Foreman. Poop is about to get real. Mr. Bowman says, you missed Hayden Fisher. All right. Von Miller. Thank you, Rob South. Von Miller, 30-year-old, asthmatic. Struggled a little bit with COVID, a little bit. Untitled Beer Ranking Show says, I was talking about doing the chat and stuff. All right. Uh, Michael Kent says, pretty sure he went to Xavier, I thought anyways. You're talking about Jordan Crawford. Went to Xavier, and then he transferred to Indiana. You're right. Michael Kent, uh, Bo Meester, Mark Vassett, next year's class. Actually, Indiana, then Xavier. My bad. Got that one. Okay. Chrome Zify says, if you may, it may have already come up already, but where do you think Ms. Linsky is going? Ms. Linsky, all indications, Michigan State and Iowa. 
He had a great visit with Michigan State, had a lot to say about Michigan State. I've always said over the years that a recruit that has more to say about one particular school, that helps. I didn't do the interview, so I didn't ask him about Michigan State and Iowa, so I can't quite perfectly gauge which one he talked the most about. Iowa has had some tough um, press here lately. I think, it, I think it sounds good for Michigan State right now. Bjorn Charlie says, I thought the problem with people my age group getting it 24 and under are usually asymptomatic and pass it on to older people without knowing it. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, you could, you could move. You, that's, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there, was, there were talks that people that were asymptomatic were not contagious, but I think they're still trying to figure that out. And there's no question the people at risk are the older people. Older coaches, you get coaches into their late 50s, 60s, 70s. Jim Beheim, 74 years old. So what do you do with them? Hey, you know, I don't think you ask 2,000 college kids to just not play to protect some coaches. The coaches have gotten a real nice ride for a long time. I love the coaches, but, you know, the coaches have been talking for a long time like they're educators. Bob Knight used to always say he's an educator. Mike Krzyzewski always said he's an educator. Well, if you're an educator, then you're also an essential worker. I don't think the people that worked at Kroger tried to opt out or the nurses. All right, I'm not I'm not trying to shame the coaches. But the coaches, I mean, I understand they could they could take a year off and sit out or something like that. I don't think if everything else is going well, I don't think protecting the coaches should come up as a reason to cancel the season. Bjorn Charlie says, regardless, if done correctly, everyone should be generally safe. I agree with that. No question. And maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm being naive and too uh, reckless on this stuff. But we may know more by September. By September, the South might be in better shape and we might be having a relapse. Well, never, we don't know. Rob South says, Plax goes his choice for the best. Mike Bell says, I forgot about Gene Washington, 1965. I've only seen highlights of him. Anyway, hey, great discussion tonight. Appreciate it. Another hour and a half in the books. My plan is to have like just to go 25 minutes, boom, 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 have three of these a week. This week isn't the week because I got some, we got some coaching and stuff. Got something going on on Wednesday. Dave Pendle put that together. Looking forward to that with the alumni clubs. Um, Friday, got some visitors coming to town. I won't be able to do this Friday night. One of you guys might be watching. He's probably asleep by now. He might have watched for three minutes and I probably bored him, but he's going to be at the house here. So I can't do it Friday. Thursday got practice. Wednesday I've got the thing, the alumni thing. If my voice still works, possible to do something on Thursday afternoon? I don't know. But right now, maybe this is the only one this week. But at some point, we'd like to go 25, 25, 25, three times a week and get you guys involved in a different way. That's down the road. Osable Fly Shop, not a sponsor. Hope everybody has a good Monday night and a great Tuesday. Hope everybody's safe. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time. You've been watching Spartan Mag Live.